Thank you. Thanks, uh, Robbie, for asking me to be here and I'm glad I could do it on relatively short notice. Um, I'm also very happy to be here uh, to talk to all you guys. When, when Javi asked me to speak, I thought, you know, gosh, it'd be wonderful if I could talk about something that was really specific to the work that we've been doing in Southern California with DUDEC, but um, through a variety of reasons, that's not possible, and NDNAs and, uh, you know, all kinds of politics and relative levels of completion. So I thought I would talk about something um, that has to do with work I did for a long time in Alaska, um, not because it's, and it's not totally in the rearview mirror. It's something that um, I'm writing about now and um, something that I'd like to, uh, I published on recently, well, in the last three years. And also, um, what, what I'm hoping to do again. So I'll kind of like introduce this to all of this to you at the moment. So let's see if I can share some pictures and some slides here. Okay. Uh, let's do this full screen. So is that visible to everyone? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Cool. All right, so volcanism and the archeology span of human settlement on the Alaska Peninsula. Um, this is the general region that, that I'm gonna be talking about. And if you look at the Alaska Peninsula, which is always like the, the thumb on your hand of Alaska, runs out into the <clears throat> Aleutian Islands and the entire region is volcanic. I mean, there's almost no soil that isn't volcanic. It's like one tephra stacked upon the other. Uh, and I think even now uh, in that region, there's something like 16 active volcanoes. So a big part of this is about the way that, understanding the way that people um, both in the past and today, uh, certainly in the 20th century have dealt with volcanism, both um, <clears throat> on a sort of short-term perspective of resilience, but also on long-term perspectives of cultural evolution. Uh, and in particular, I'm interested, and I was interested in this region of the central Alaska Peninsula, where there's two really massive volcanoes, the Vinyamina volcano and the Aniakchak volcano, both of which have these enormous calderas. The one on the right, Aniakchak, if you can see kind of this little thing called gates here, uh, you can fly an airplane into it. You can fly around in the middle of that volcano. So it's enormous. The Vinyaminov is not quite as large, but, but similarly shaped. And in the, today it has a glacier in the middle and, a, and an active smoking vent. And you can see that they, they each continue to have smaller vents inside of them to this day. Well, so one of the things that are, are just looking at some of the dates of this and the, the potential impacts of these volcanoes, the Aniakchak caldera was formed approximately 3,400 radiocarbon years ago. Black Peak is a smaller one to the, to the southwest of it, 3,700 to 4,000 radiocarbon years ago. So, and the Vinyamina volcano is maybe a little bit older. And one of the things we're trying to do is, is figure out the, the timing of these things by looking at archeology. span um, But we're also really trying to figure out something about the, the effects that the output of these volcanoes had on human settlement and potentially uh, cultural change. And these areas of red and orange are regions that we can track the, the deposition of tephra from each of these different volcanoes, including lahars, et cetera. So if you look at just these two massive caldera forming eruptions, Aniakchak was like 100 cubic kilometers, right? About 3,700 years ago. So not radiocarbon anymore. Vinyaminov, about 50 cubic kilometers, about 4,100. So within a space of about 400 years, you've got 150 cubic kilometers coming up out of the ground, depositing right back on the ground in terms of its most of its volume, which fundamentally affects the landscape of a fairly narrow peninsula in the Pacific subduction zone. And you know, lots of people have, have talked about the devastating effects of uh, ash and ash and acid rain uh, on people all up and down uh, uh, Western and Northwestern Alaska. Richard Vanderhoek, for example, has, has uh, timed this up with all kinds of cultural changes from uh, you know, uh, changes in archeological archaeological cultures and, and material artifacts um, also has timed it to what he thought were, uh, you know, um, I guess hiatuses in the cultural record. Now, now given the archeology span of Western Alaska, which is not anywhere near as highly resolved as this in Southern California, or probably anywhere in Western North America, the lower 48, uh, some of this is a little bit questionable, but um, you know, it stands as a reasonable hypothesis. 
um, just to sort of look at things uh, in terms of the archaeological cultures. You know, people have long talked about variations between terrestrial focused economies and maritime economies, going back to some of the earliest evidence for human settlement of the Alaska Peninsula. Um, you start to get, you know, after 4,000 years, you start to get more divergence in the region. Things start to look a little bit more different. You start to see the absence of these, what archaeologists have called clear distinctions between terrestrial and marine economies that start to become, uh, uh, they start to become more holistic, I suppose. After about 3,000 years ago, you see much more linguistic or um, culturally, uh, cultural diversity in terms of archaeological assemblages. Um, things start, you see increasing sedentism. You start to see after 4,000 years ago, the emergence of intensive fishing economies, more stable communities, uh, lower residential mobility, et cetera, et cetera. But, but this region around the two volcanoes has been very confusing in part, be, well, probably mostly because there has been very little work done there. Uh, it's really hard to get to. Uh, the Antioch Crate Caldera itself is in is a is a national monument managed by the National Park Service, uh, of which was one of the park units that I ma uh, managed. I was also uh, a National Park Service archaeologist at Katmai, Alagnac, and Antioch. And the Antioch National Monument is the least visited of all the Park Service units in the United States. I think many years they have like 30 people visit. Uh, and the reason for that is it's distant, it's far away, it's hard to get to, it's costly. Um, so not a lot of work's been done there, but also there's this convergence of lots of kind of unique archeological traditions, whether it's Norton, Kachemak, Aleutian, et cetera. And um, so it's, it's sort of like a, been a no man's land. And, and, and we tried to, to get in there and understand it a little bit. Um, and I'll show you what we learned, although it's far from subtle. The other thing that's quite interesting is that this area is also the division between two uh, fairly distinct ethno-linguistic groupings. And, and I put these in quotes, Aleutian and Eskimo, because these aren't the, the words that native people use today. These are the words that linguists have, have used to describe the similarities and differences between Southwest Alaskan uh, uh, languages. And um, this is an area where even, even historically has been kind of a combination of both of them, but also not a lot of people lived there. Uh, and, and if you were to go southwest or northeast, uh, they're, they're quite distinct. So this is a, you know, various people, old school archaeologists like Don DeMond and, uh, you know, have described you know, or that, that perhaps these big caldera forming eruptions had something to do with the separation of people for significant, uh, significant amount of time or long enough for them to diverge both culturally and linguistically. And so we don't know when that would have been. People have made suggestions about 5,000 years ago, 3,500, 2,000 years ago, et cetera, uh, but we don't know. So one of the things we wanted to do was kind of look and say, well, all right, well, let's go out there and see if we could find, you know, the sort of pre-eruption archeological uh, context or archeological character of the people who are living there and find out if the volcanic eruptions had any significant effect on um, pushing people in one direction or the other, how long it might have been, uh, and whether or not these things really changed over the interval of intensive mid Holocene volcanism. So we outlined a, a rather ambitious and perhaps foolhardy project to survey, survey 2,050 square kilometers uh, in these general regions in between the two volcanoes, the Antioch and the Vinyaminov volcano. And you might say, well, you know, how did you do that? How could you possibly condescend to think you could do that? This sounds ridiculous in the context of modern cultural resource management and any other archaeology. And that's true. But again, this is this is sort of exploratory. And we had the funding to do it. Um, I was able to procure that through the National Park Service and generate the cooperative agreements with the University of Alaska. And at the time, uh, I was working for the Park Service, then the University of Alaska, then the University of Pittsburgh. But also, I was able to, because I lived on the peninsula, was able to spend a lot of time with the communities around the peninsula to, to basically gather their interest and, and help them to uh, well, help them to understand what we wanted to do, ask them to help contribute to the, the direction of the project. And um, I also had the funding to go out quite easily in a small airplane on a regular basis to go to schools, meet with village elders, talk to the village councils, talk to the village corporations and figure it out. Uh, so it was kind of a, a unique, I think, coalescence of all of those possibilities and 
um, which would be something that would be quite difficult if, if you weren't based there because you couldn't fly out, say, for spring break very easily in a small plane if you had to travel from San Diego or Orange County or even Pittsburgh for that matter. So it worked out that I was able to do it. And I was able to do a lot of that in part because the Park Service had been notoriously terrible at communicating with its neighboring communities. And so I was able to get a significant amount of funding to go out and make um, basically cultural contact, which is sort of a silly word, but it was for the purpose of dealing with cultural resources and the interpretation, interpretation of cultural resources throughout the region. And the project that I got funded um, only took part, in, it was only based in small part on a nat National Park Service unit. So the rest of it was on a combination of U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, lands administered, by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, lands owned and controlled by village corporations, lands owned and controlled by regional corporations. Um, and the village corporation and regional corporations are, if you're not familiar with Alaska, are, are very distinct from the lower 48 and that groups aren't organized, uh, native groups are not organized in any kind of reservation system. And as a result of legislation that changed in the late 1970s and early 80s, federally owned lands were, were apportioned to native communities. And so there are local community areas right around specific villages that are controlled by communities of say anywhere from eight to several hundred people. Uh, and then there are broader regional corporations that help to uh, bring all of these communities together into a larger body of, 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 of basically collective management and collective bargaining uh, with um, all kinds of other entities, whether it's development or law or medicine, or healthcare, et cetera. And so putting all this together was, was kind of fun. And these in, the, in orange are the regions that we surveyed. And you don't get out there on foot because there's not a road anywhere. It would take you a week to walk to a specific archaeological site. And in the summertime, you can't do it because on the coastal plains, it's impassable. You could maybe get there in the winter on a snow machine or in the past, of course, a dog sled. Um, but then you wouldn't be able to excavate anything. You wouldn't be able to see anything. Uh, and so what we did is we, we, we ran a series of aerial surveys and transects, both a combination of fixed wing airplanes and uh, lightweight, small helicopters. Um, <clears throat> this is still like logistically complex because it's not like there's gas stations nearby or, or very convenient runways. There's a few military, old military outposts that have runways that were built during the World War II. Uh, these are sometimes converge with um, uh, canning and fishing communities. Um, canning and fishing communities usually have a little runway. Uh, you can barge in, you have to barge in fuel from uh, Seattle, for example, uh, just to get this stuff done because it's so far from the nearest place where there are major fuel stores. So you can see we had to cache uh, fuel barrels in these different uh, canning and, and fishing communities. Sometimes we'd have to go out and uh, if we were gonna survey a particular area, we'd have to drop, we'd have to fly into a lake that I couldn't find anybody who'd ever landed in. Uh, these lakes are usually little kettle ponds. And this is an example of where it didn't work quite well. So we had a de Havilland beaver, we load three 50 gallon drums of ab gas into it. We fly into the lake, which is plenty large to land and to take off. The problem is, is when you're fully loaded, uh, it isn't deep enough. So we're stuck out in the middle of there. And the only way you get unstuck is by kicking the barrels out of the airplane and dragging them over the shore with the intention of the helicopters coming in at a later date to do this. Again, this is something that it would be very hard for me or anyone to manage from a distant state. But if you're working and living on the Alaska Peninsula, you have a chance and a shot at doing it. Um, so you'd say, well, what do you look for in this aerial survey in a region that is either waterlogged in the summer, covered with alders, there's no forest down here. This is well beyond the southern extent of the, the spruce forest. So you get little scrub, tundra vegetation, alders, birches, willows, things like that. But there's almost no surface exposures except in those places where you have what would basically be akin to a desert blowout. You have sort of winds blowing sands away or, or a volcanic tephra and sediments. Uh, and then you get these kind of, you can see archeological deposits in them, but those aren't the only things, right? One of the things that we were looking at, and I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if my, uh, is my uh, toolbar in the way of all this stuff? No, we can't see it. Okay, good. Well, so one of the things we were looking for is, 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 is 
geomorphological evidence, paleolandforms of the effects of those mid-Holocene volcanic eruptions. And as we started flying around in this area, we started to see these terraces. And these are wave cut terraces from the former ocean line, right? These is the, this is, so they're now filled in with volcanic tephra and a combination of volcanic tephra and tectonic uplift. But it's really interesting that you could basically find these paleo waveforms where you would expect people prior to those uh, volcanic, the caldera forming eruptions to live. So we, we, one of our goals was to survey those intensively. Sorry, I'm having trouble uh, fast forwarding here. Um, oops. I don't know why it's going slowly, my apologies. Okay. By the way, these trails are, are all just bear trails. Bears and moose are the only thing that create lasting impacts on these environments here. Okay, here's another example of a wave cut terrace, old former coastal terrace, and then would have, what would have been an estuary of sorts. Okay, so if you were to look at the landscape today and you can see this is Vinny Amanoff and this is Antioch Jack, and we've got Big Bay here and village of Port Hyden, Meshik, and the Meshik River and Chignik River and a bunch of other rivers that are coming into both Bristol Bay and also the Pacific Ocean. But if you were to just hypothetically remove 20 meters of sediment, you'd see what would happen to these old coastlines. Right? We just do this simply in GIS, remove 20, 20 meters of dirt and inundate it with seawater. And so these are these basically track those wave cut terraces that we're finding in fragments. So it's kind of interesting to see what it might have looked like before these volcanoes put out 150 cubic kilometers of, of rubble. And this, this just shows you where the modern shoreline is relative to what would have been that 20, 20 meter removal. And also these are known archeological sites, both through this project and others. And those that are out in the water would have happened afterwards. And perhaps these are, so our, our idea was that maybe we'd really be finding some interesting pre-volcanic eruption deposits and that those would help us understand something about the different hypotheses people have offered. So if we were to continue to do her, Aerial survey, of course, we're looking for human settlements. This is an example, this is Chignik Lagoon. This is a contemporary native fishing village and, and with a small, some small canning enterprise uh, and a runway right in the middle of it. These are the kinds of things we end up looking for from both airplane and helicopter. And these are the, these are the settlements that uh, you, you don't, that you can find from airplanes. And they're very distinct after we start to figure it out is that all of these little divots that you find throughout here, these sort of greenish colored and the buff colored, are all either house features or storage features. They're sub semi subterranean houses and storage pits where the vegetation, where they collect water and the tephra and the vegetation grows differently, but also the human impacts over the time that people have lived there thousands of years ago change the chemistry of the soil and change the vegetation. Right, so these become, once you realize this, these stick out like sore thumbs. And in fact, the, the helicopter and airplane pilots that we contracted with to do this got so good that they could find the archeological sites even between ferrying us around to do things. And all of the pilots that I know, given that I live there, would then send me GPS points of stuff that they found, not only for this project, but over the entire peninsula. And it becomes a really fascinating way of doing archeological survey, at least for relatively large aggregations that had where people were um, uh, occupying and, and altering for hundreds of years to millennia. You can see it in a little bit closer. Here's a wave cut terrace. And then all of these are semi-subterranean houses. And our, our goal was to then get on the sites after we'd located them and test them. Here's an example of a really enormous one. This is a village called Unangashek, which is on the Bristol Bay coast. And it even has uh, milled lumber houses where there's a known um, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox church. Russian Orthodox church is of course a native church. 
Uh, and this is known to the people of the village of Port Hyden. Their grandparents used to go there for parties in the middle of winter. This was something of a pilgrimage. Um, they're collapsed churches. Other villages have, of course, standing churches, but they know this. This is not true of all of the villages or settlements that we see of varying sizes. This is just a really, this is like a, 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 a Middle Eastern tell, a hoyak. This is massive accumulation of stuff with hundreds and hundreds of houses. This is not something I usually think about with Alaskan hunter-gatherers, and most people don't either, but it's definitely the case on the Alaska Peninsula. And part of it has to do with this proximity to this, this stream that's right next to the ocean that has, this one in particular, has about a million salmon go up in each summer. Uh, but there's smaller ones. You know, you find little, little bitty ones. There's a couple of houses um, spread throughout here and there. Um, here's an example of a little settlement on a small tributary creek. I think it had about seven houses. Here we've parked a helicopter in one of them. Um, so with the floats, you can, it's pretty low impact. There's no chain, there's no devastation to the vegetation or to the site. Um, but you can just get a sense of the size that we could, we're, I think we're parked in this particular house here. Uh, and we mapped them all with high resolution, differentially corrected GPS units. And you can, once you start to do that, even when people, even field techs who may or not be that familiar with it can start to see the differences in the berms around the houses. So you get these big circular ones, you get ovular ones, and then you get these really cool ones, which some people have called amoeba-like or daisy-like. And these are diagnostic of something that's that emerged about 500 years ago that comes off the Kodiak Peninsula. They're called Koniag houses. They're multi-room houses. They signal a real change in power structures and intensive fishing. Uh, and they're fairly late in time. Many of these others are much earlier. So we wanted to figure out again the distribution of these different house forms throughout the peninsula, when they show up, et cetera. Uh, here's just an example, of, again, of another none of the settlements. This crew, very small group, has been dropped off on the on that village or on that settlement, on that archaeological site, on that resource to try to uh, test it, right, and map it and test it. The, the mapping, of course, is the first thing that you do. You figure out what's what what it is that's going to be the most likely pr to produce both single and ideally multi-component um, evidence. And as you go down in these little 50 by 50 centimeter test units, of course, it's all super lightweight. We don't even, we don't even have the weight to bring big shaker screens because everything's gotta be compact into a little you know, Robinson 44 helicopter. Um, we're out there for weeks. Uh, and you know, so everything is super lightweight. All of this that you see is Tephra. Each one of these has a somewhat definite age, somewhat definite. Uh, for volcanoes that are both big and large. I mean, they're, they're putting out tephra all the time. So it's not like every one has been resolved by the, the vol vol volcanologists or geologists. And then of course you have these nice charcoal horizons right in the middle. That's something that appeals to us for the work that we were doing. And as you have one that's below another diagnostic tephra, you have a charcoal horizon from a previous component that perhaps you could not see on the surface. So we were going through and just you know, excavating these little test units in the middle of these depressions, sometimes finding as many as three, usually one, often two, uh, archaeological components. And so that was the essence of what we were doing here, was basically generating datable components without really learning that much about the total artifact assemblage, because we neither had the time nor really the perspective to do that properly. Um, so we wanted to know something more simply about the ages. We also did not put multiple holes in a single house. Uh, this is all about preservation. A single unit that's mapped very, with high resolution GPS uh, would not affect uh, future excavations or even preservation. A point on the, the question of preservation, unlike different parts of Alaska, particularly Northwest Alaska, where you have amazing preservation of wood and bone due to the fact that it's frozen and often anaerobic, nothing organic preserves in this part of the world because of the volcanic soils beyond about 300 years ago, right? So there's, there is no, uh, there was no building material. There is no fabric, there is no wood. Right. And this was this is something very different from other parts of Alaska. It has to do with the soil. Of course, the other things that we did on the, um, the wave cut terraces, which you can see in the background, is extensive augering. Um, we had 
multiple extensions on these big, you know, three inch bucket augers with the ratcheting handle and multiple crews going out. Uh, we spent weeks and weeks looking for components on these wave cut terraces where we expected people to be prior to the volcanic eruptions. And unfortunately, found nothing, uh, which is too bad, but uh, that's not to say that we didn't learn anything. It's just of the things that we wanted to uncover prior to that volcanic eruption, uh, we didn't get to it. And in part is because the closer you get to the volcanoes, in some cases that tephra is 50 meters deep, right? So, the, you know, the, the 3,700 year old volcanic eruption of, of Antiochia can be 50 meters deep on the, on the proximate uh, lobes of the volcano. And then even more recent ones, like even in the 1930s can be five meters deep. Uh, the, the Katmai eruption that formed Katmai National Park in the early 20th century is in many places 30 meters deep from a single pyroclastic flow. So this is not an easy thing to do. Okay. At the end of the day, after doing this for three different years, um, we recorded a, a lot of new sites, a lot. We did 60, right? And again, this is there's no surface exposure here. So finding these uh, through a combination of vegetation changes and then and then some other, you know, sometimes like in the yeah, closer to the coast, you have eroding coastal bluffs that can also reveal. Uh, uh, buried sites, and we found a few of those. Uh, we did. We we tested 26 of them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We generated 83 new radiocarbon dates, and it's the 83 new radiocarbon dates that help us to figure out something about the spatial variation of activity on the on this portion of the Alaska Peninsula. And I'll just show that to you here. And so basically, if I took all of the sites that we looked at, we, I could divide those into three, three regions, the Chignik, uh, um, Chignik River, Meshik River, and the Pacific Coast. And if I add to all of the sites that other people have looked at, either through BIA surveys or transfers or US Fish and Wildlife efforts, or even some groups out of the Alutic Museum, which is a native owned museum out of Kodiak Peninsula. They've done a number of projects up in here. So basically I've taken all of the areas within about 300 kilometers and tried to figure out what, are, what the patterns might be in terms of spatial temporal relationships. And again, this is super low resolution if you think about the kind of work that people do in California or many other parts of the lower 48. And so what we do is we take these, uh, just the radiocarbon dates. Uh, radiocarbon dates, if you're, I know, I know everybody, everybody who's an archeologist works with them, but, but they're not a point estimate. They don't tell you a, a, an exact point in time. They're a probability distribution, right? And so if you combine all of the probability distributions of all the radiocarbon dates you get, you get a curve because each one in itself is really just a curve. And it's not a normal curve because of the calibration. The, not, the curve is non-normal, it can be bimodal. And if you combine all of them, you can start to see some patterns. So the pattern we see throughout that segment, that 300 kilometer segment, if I look at the top one, which is all of the central peninsula, so there's 151 radiocarbon dates. Each one of these is different regions that we've looked at and tried to understand them. So if you look at the whole region, what you have here, these are the earliest occupations that we can, we can record. So we did pick up in a couple of places, basically a river, it's the Chicknick River. We do have a site that predates the, uh, uh, the eruptions and that, that information comes from a very deeply buried component um, right next to the village of Chicknick Lake. But then you look at the period of intense volcanism. This is you know, about 4,000 to 3,600 years ago. We've got nothing, or at least when we originally started looking at this, we had nothing. And then you say, well, how long does it take for people to come back? We know we had people here. We've got the volcanism here. Well, the earliest evidence for human people, people resettling this volcanically devastated landscape is a thousand years. You might say, well, is that a sampling problem? And the answer to that is, of course. However, why would people be gone for even that amount of time? Well, the thing is, is that all of the estuaries are silted in. All of the streams are filled in. An environment that's today marked by the prominence of salmon fisheries would have effectively been dead. All of the landscape is covered by tephra. There's, there would have been no caribou. There would have been no salmon. There would have been no nearshore resources. Right? But what does happen is 
after a thousand years, you start to see little drips and drabs of people coming back into the landscape. And those are, this is the Chignik River and all of these few sites that are very close to the Pacific coast. So it's the Pacific coast that, that rebounds earliest. It's the big migratory fish that are not anadromous, the ones that don't depend on rivers, things like cod, shellfish, uh, marine mammals. Those things can repopulate at least they can repopulate first, but it takes a significant amount of time. Okay, and so then we look at different regions, we could come up with different ideas about when that happens. But interestingly here, we look at the largest of the volcanic explosions, which is Antioch Check. And so we're looking at all of the evidence along the Meshek River and it's 2,500 years until people really start to repopulate this landscape, which is not to say that people didn't walk through. It's not to say that people couldn't go there. It's to say that there weren't enough people there that could take advantage of regular enough resources to develop large settlements of the kind that archeologists are gonna find thousands of years later. We also can record other periods where population tends to disappear. And these are having to do with perhaps other volcanic eruptions that are not as severe as the ones that we know of from 4,000 to 4,600 years ago, but they've had an impact nevertheless. And the, these have kind of escaped the, the interest of volcanologists, but, they, but the, here the archeological record is pointing to possibilities in volcanic devastation, uh, devastation to, to, to biotic resources that force people to work and live elsewhere. And, and those are kinds of things that I, I find really interesting. And it also happens that, that this is on the, the heel of a number of different cultural changes as well. So uh, these are all things we, we basically setting up possibilities for, for new work. I wanna show you one, one place in here that uh, is, I, I kind of haven't discussed that much uh, because it was outside of our initial survey, but I wanna show you a specific large settlement. And it's something that's, uh, that we found, we found uh, through the course of uh, um, aerial reconnaissance. Um, it is not something that's known to any of the native communities around. It does not possess one of those uh, milled lumber uh, settlements on top. There is no church. There's no records of it in any of the Russian Orthodox or native Orthodox or Creole Orthodox, whatever you want to call it, uh, records baptisms, et cetera, the same, they have the, and they have the, many of the same kinds of records of marriage, baptism, death that you see in the mission records of California. Um, and this place is not on the map, which suggests that this place was not occupied when the Russian imperial colonists showed up. Um, it also means that it hasn't been manipulated, modified, destroyed, or altered by anything during the colonial era which is kind of interesting. And so what does this place called Wild Man Lake look like? Well, when we started flying over it, we started seeing all, I mean, you can, you can just pick it out right now. This is solid houses on one little section, another solid band of houses on another section, another solid band of houses on another section. And they all kind of coalesce around these riffles. And what are the riffles good for? Catching salmon. You don't have to build fancy weirs. You don't have to do dip nets. You basically just create little dams and pull the fish out of the water. And this little river system has 500,000 salmon today that come up through it. So we thought, well, this would be a pretty fantastic place to look at uh, and investigate a little bit further. You can see this is another segment of it. Um, they're really everywhere on this one little stretch between two lakes. You can start to see in some cases variations in house forms or perhaps variation in the vegetation that's in there. This by the way, is a multi-room house. This is a very large sort of earlier period house that we know of now. There's also monuments around some of these, these, these hilltops, cairns and such that have, we were pretty excited about this, um, point styles that are much, much older than the volcanic eruptions, in particular what we call the Northern Archaic points. And these, these, these hilltops are also fantastic for looking out at the coastal plain, which is where today you can view all of the, the, the caribou migration, right? So the caribou moves up and down this peninsula, wintering in the north, calving in the south, they move past here. Uh, you cannot chase a caribou herd. You can't, people can't follow it. 
uh, you have to intercept it. So these look lookouts for 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 uh, native folks, uh, and certainly thousands of years ago, were incredibly important, and we have them here. So what is, what what did we sort of look at at Wildman Lake? Well, we have these two kind of there's upper and lower Wildman Lake, and there's what we call the Ocean River. The, the origin of the river is right here. It's not very far upstream, and then it goes out to the coast, sort of meanders out. It's about seven and a half kilometers, I think it is. And there are some really large aggregations of houses, storage features, and a number of other things that are larger than even the large city-state type uh, uh, settlements I was showing you earlier. In fact, I think this is probably the largest prehistoric Aboriginal settlement in all of Alaska. There are hundreds of houses that have never been touched, looked at, looked at or investigated other than our, our uh, depredations of a few years ago. And they're all right on the slope of the today, this is the Vinyaminoff volcano, right? So right next to it, this is the, this is, these are the sites, you can walk right up there. And many days when we're working there, it is steaming, right? So you're like, are these people, were these people ever particularly <laughs> deterred by these massive, Volcanoes? Absolutely not. But we wanted to look at that a little bit more carefully. Just to show you a couple of the kinds of things that you see in house features from the surface. You know, these are the, um, these are, this one in particular is I think 1800 years old. So even though it's 1800 years old, it still has the shape, right? Even though it's been covered and blanketed in tephra multiple times, not 50 meters, not 100 meters, not 20 meters, but there's enough in it that when we excavate down in the center heart, look for the center heart, we do find it under a, a very reasonable amount. These you can see, these are the little daisy shaped, amoeba shaped houses. Uh, they're very clear, they stick out. These are all, these all post date about 500 years ago. And they're really cool, really interesting. It's a fundamentally different uh, house form, social organization, artifact type, everything. All of the attributes of, of that you see as an archeologist are, are very unique to the region and they're all really clearly right out of Kodiak. In fact, one of the presentations that uh, I would give to the, the, the closest native villages had to do with what we call the frontier pioneers of the Kodiak. So many of the people in the region today identify with, with Kodiak on the lines of a linguistic um, ethnonym called Alutic, Alutic Sugpiak, which used, used to, people used to call Pacific Eskimo, or Southwest Eskimo, stuff like that. And, and even the Russians called them all Aleuts, so that's not a very meaningful term, but, but folks today recognize and know their ancestral connection to the people of Kodiak. And here they're seeing these settlements, they're the furthest Southern distribution of this house type and these artifact types. And there's a direct linguistic, ethno-linguistic connection between them and the folks that are living there today. And they really like the idea that they're living on the frontier of their sort of ethno-linguistic sphere. And uh, that was the, the main thing that came away from all of the presentations I would give in these, these the, the, the contemporary villages, school children, elder councils, et cetera. There are a number of different house types that you can see, which all have sort of different ages and different identities. And, and we just slowly started to pick those out. But when you only dig 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter holes in the ground, you don't collect a significant, uh, you don't collect a large enough assemblage of diagnostic artifacts to really characterize them with any confidence statistically. But we have hints about them, the occasional diagnostic point, you know, unusual fishing weights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, most of this project is really about the timing and the spatial distribution of it. Just to show you what those houses might have looked like, because there are photographs um, from the late uh, 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 1800s and early 1900s. Of course, you can see these are these have been have incorporated milled lumber into them for doors. So these are uh, uh, well after Euro American settlement. But people continued to live in these traditional. Um, semi-subterranean sod cover houses uh, into the 1920s in some places. Uh, and they, they all, everybody today uses a Russian word for them. They call them barabara uh, or barabari. And that's, you know, even some of the folks in the, the elder folks in the villages that I would work in would remember that their grandmother had lived with one when they were a little kid. 
you know, so these things, you know, might go back to even maybe the 30s, depending on how far you were away from the opportunity to build a modern construction with copious milled lumber, bricks, and concrete. Um, people continued to live into them, and perhaps some of the elders held on to them longer because they, uh, they wanted to. It was familiar. Um, one of the in also interesting notes about these houses that I, I learned over and over from, from folks out there is that you don't live in these in the summer. And the reason, I, and it never occurred to me like that, and it's one of the most important things for trying to interpret the, the settlement patterns of the archeology span is that these houses fill up with water once the ground thaws. <laughs> so like, like they're perfect winter houses. They even have a cold trap, you know, that, that they're, so they're an import from, from, uh, from uh, what was called Thule culture, which then is brought down to Kodiak and then spreads down to the peninsula. But, but uh, they're wonderful for the winter and they're wonderful for the spring, but then ground starts to thaw um, towards the end of May. And then you got to get out and do something else, which is interesting because a lot of these houses are built around uh, salmon runs, which are only then in the summer. So it's almost as if people come back and the, the story that one old guy told me is like, well, they just came back and they camped in tents while they collect fish. They put all the fish in the ground and then they left, right? And so the connection with that contemporary understanding of when you go get in fish, when you go to your winter home, when you go work for a commercial enterprise, all of those things that are still today a part of the fabric of, of, of native life in Alaska really helps the archeologists i.e. me, who didn't know this stuff and, and, and wouldn't have imagined it, to interpret the spatial distribution of, of cultural material. Um, more cool pictures here, fish drying racks. You know, you can see a log cabin built in the background. Um, these are, uh, again, just different photos that folks have taken of these different settlements at different times. Um, Another other important feature is that when we started to see a cluster of houses along a river, we would see these odd mounds, you know, and, and at first I thought, well, they're just a geological feature, but we didn't find them anywhere, anywhere else. They were all within, you know, 50 to 100 yards of some very distinct cluster of houses. We started calling them site proximal mounds because we don't know what they are and we didn't want to excavate them. Um, but they're recurrent and they're reliable. And when you have really large aggregations, they all sit around the perimeter of them. I don't know what they are. I don't know if they're associated with something ceremonial. I don't know if they have to do with burial. Uh, we did probe a few of them and you do hit pockets through the middle, right? So there are, it's dense, 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 nothing, dense, dense, dense. So there's something in there and there's something that's, uh, uh, unknown to the native communities around there, but of course, incredibly dear and uh, uh, important to them. I did tell you, we don't really see building materials, but this is a whale bone. So we start to get these appearing in those recent houses kind of around the perimeter. Uh, we start to see them in little bits and pieces. And when you first look at the map, you're like, the ocean is so far away. Why is there whale bone here? And the one argument was there's no trees, so you're either bringing driftwood or whalebone in from the coast, dragging it up on the ice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not really sure. Well, we did some other work, again, looking in this region. And what we did is we started, again, looking at these wave cut terraces near the settlement. We did a lot of coring down in here and we can find basal peats 330 years ago, 290 years ago, covering a lacustrine or a uh, oceanic sediments. So here's an example of something where tectonism, probably not volcanic infilling, has fundamentally changed where the coastline is relative today. So we sort of figured it out that this would have been the coastline at let's say 500 years ago. And the proximity to our, our site that we're talking about is it's right here. So this would have been a, a kind of embayment with little islands out there maybe shallow, this place is heavily influenced by the tides. We've got seven meter tides in some places. So there might've been times when you get animals up here, or at least you could drag them by water, their bones, their carcasses back up into here. It would have been a really short salmon run right into little lakes. It would have been a fantastic place, which explains why there are so many houses of so many different ages and literally thousands of storage features that people would have been coming back to for thousands of years. And you say, well, how long was it? All right, so if I look at 
Um, these are three large settlements in the, the kind of near, this is the one I'm talking about, Wild Man. This is called Hot Springs, which is much further down the Alaska Peninsula and Adamagon, which is even further down. Um, and those, those two were, have been studied by a variety of teams over the years, you might argue plundered, and some of which is true, going back to the 50s. Actually, even Hrdlicka was, was here in the 1920s or 30s, I think it was. Um, and, but we do have some good archaeology that's done there. And if I take all the radiocarbon dates and compare them to wild man, along with the radiocarbon evidence for the different volcanic eruptions, right? So here is the, the probability distribution of Veni Amanov. Here's the probability distribution of Veni Akchak. Here's the probability distribution of the earliest components at Wildman Lake. So I can see them living there almost back to 4,000 years ago. But as soon as that eruption in that region of volcanic eruption, it's hard, to, they're still there, right? So the timing of this to this is like, if they, if they would have left, if the volcanic devastation of that most proximate volcano was so severe, they came back or they left immediately. Of course, some of this has to do with the vicissitudes of calibration and went to some of the other settlements, just a few, you know, uh, dozens of kilometers down the peninsula. We of course have different components of occupation that would track different kinds of possibilities. Uh, and, you know, we have pre-eruption occupation elsewhere in the region. We have a little bit of pre-eruption occupation at, Vinny, at Wild Man Lake, and then we have other pulses of it as well. And I think also one of the things that our evidence shows is when we have the archeological in, um, uh, evidence for the emergence of intensive river and fishing. So this according to, like if you look at stable isotope values from lake cores throughout the region, and you look at the, the nitrogen content in those lake barbs, you can kind of see when salmon productivity both stabilizes and increases. And it's often consonant with when we see the increase in the number of people in these large river and based archeological sediments, which settlements, which is all between about 1700 and a thousand years ago. Some of which corresponds to a cultural component or a cultural configuration that people generally call Norton. This is when the big villages really explode. Before that, they're drips and drabs. This is when you start to see cultural continuity all over Western Alaska. This is, uh, it's quite fascinating, the, the correspondence between the archeological evidence for intensive widespread fishing and the, and the paleoenvironmental evidence for stable salmon runs. So one of the things that, that I was kind of hoping to do and um, the, ch the challenge is gonna be in figuring out how to do this right, both with the expense and with the importance of collaboration with the folks in the region. And one of the, and, and so my, my goal in this in the long run, working with Port Hyden and with, with Chignik Lake, and of course the various agencies that, that govern the cultural resources of Alaska, is to go in there and do a fairly systematic subsurface sampling of all of this, maybe not all, but, but a, you know, a statistically significant sample of these semi-subterranean dwellings and storage features to try to figure out more than just what my calibrated radiocarbon distribution is gonna say. So something like how many of these houses were occupied at approximately the same time? When is the real pulse of construction and building? When is the real pulse of, of, of building these clay-lined semi-subterranean pits? When do we see something more than just my slapdash the evidence that I brought from my slapdash sampling, like, because I fully admit that this is not statistically rigorous. It is not randomly sampled. It is totally exploratory. So the way to do this probably, excuse me, properly, I think is to follow a model that was done at Bridge River in, uh, uh, on, the, on the Fraser River by Anna Prentice. And Anna Prentice worked with folks there, Chilliwet, and found, you know, they have, it's again, one of these large settlements with lots of semi-subterranean houses. Uh, I love this diagram because it shows how, when, when they collapse and where the berms remain and what happens when people rebuild them and how they accumulate and how people preferentially choose old depressions to build new depressions in, which is why it's possible to core down and find multiple components in a single depression. So if you, if you lay it out properly, and you use a series of remote sensing procedures that don't always work everywhere, but can work in the right context. So here's something from electric 
uh, electrical conductivity that this guy named, uh, well, his name's a guy named Guy Cross did it uh, in collaboration with Anna Prentice. Uh, and they can start to identify overlapping semi-subterranean house features. They can start to, so if you combine that with uh, magnetic gradient, um, uh, 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 remote sensing, you can start to see berms, you can start to see hearths. And they use this very productively, I think, in their exploration of Ridge River in a minimally invasive procedure in that they just targeted, you can see where the hearths are and you can see the, the, uh, the, uh, the overlapping houses. You can see hearths that are kind of out of place because they've, the berms around uh, subsequent construction have displaced what you can see on the surface. And so they went in and sampled those um, and found and were able to come up with much tighter chronology of occupation of the settlement. And not just the tighter chronology of the occupation of the settlement, but again, the number of houses to get a sense of the, 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 the size of the community and the demographics of it. And that's something that I think is going to be the next level in really understanding the relationship between the potential for volcanic devastation in this context, and the resilience of human communities over the last many thousand years. Um, the problem is again, <laughs> you know, what do we know? Uh, these are the few site, the few houses that I was able to map in the short time that we have, but there are literally hundreds in this zone. And again, it's it's using this sort of combination of resistivity, magnetometry, potentially ground penetrating radar. That's a little bit tougher to deal with in this volcanic context um, that's gonna help us identify the right sampling strategy to, to answer those questions. Um, some of the, I just, there's just another picture again, you know, looking at all the visible features. So just based on the house form, we know that these are all approximately the same age, but what about these, you know, these unusual ones, are these just the, the smaller communities of previous eras? Um, we don't know. Right. We have a few scattered uh, uh, insights that come from it. Okay, so also want to just emphasize that all of this work, um, you, you know, is really reliant on a very large number of contributors and stakeholders, including um, national the the agencies that that are the resource managers of the Alaska Peninsula, a number of academic um, efforts, including. My, my closest collaborator was the Museum of the North at the University of Alaska, but, but none of this is possible without any of the native, native corporations and councils, not simply because this is their heritage, but because a significant portion of the land that we are working on belongs to them, not just in tradition, but in deed, right? So what I could, again, like the, 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 the Alaskan village corporation and regional corporation are kind of two tiers of, 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 I guess, indigenous land ownership. So, that's, so that there's a much larger collective that helps multiple small communities band together for, uh, for legal representation, healthcare, uh, corporate entity that may have to deal with mining or fishing or logging, depending on where you are. Um, and so the buy-in of, of all of these folks is, well, it's the only way to do it. And it also makes it really hard to, to resuscitate it when you when you don't live there. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I wanted to acknowledge all of this and, and acknowledge the, the many years I had traveling around to visit all these folks. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I guess we are, can take some questions now if anyone has any questions. You can either raise your hand or you can put them in the chat box and you can read them from the chat if you don't want to turn your microphone on. I just want to say I really love the um, multidisciplinary um, or not necessarily disciplines, I guess things like geology, um, the stable isotopes, the tribal information, the, just the way you use so many different tools at your disposal to kind of paint this picture for us. Um, I know you said it wasn't comprehensive, but the spatial temporal um, image that you showed us was just really awesome. So thank you. I don't have a question. <laughs> thank, thank you for the comments. I mean, I, I think it is comprehensive, but I, I, I definitely sacrifice um, detail and resolution for space. Well done. 
Hi, Dr. Barton. We do have a question in the chat. Um, it says, can you give a reference for the federal process that set up the native corporations and councils? Uh, she said, I'm amazed to learn about this and your presentation was fabulous and, and fascinating. Thank you. Um, so the, 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 the federal process that changed the shape of land ownership in Alaska is, falls under two things. One acronym is ANILCA and the other one is ANCSA. So the first one is A-N-I-L-C-A, which I think is Alaska Native Land. Oh, gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting it all. But it basically made it possible to change the way that, that, well, change the ownership of what would have been federally owned land, allocating uh, landscapes not only to regional corporations, but to village corporations and to individuals. So individuals, for example, who had a connection to a particular hunting ground, fishing spot, fur trapping region, uh, grandma's cabin could, could create an allotment. They had the ability to say, that's my spot. And that spot, uh, which they call allotments in Alaska, um, uh, uh, I, I, the, the sad thing is that you had to be born between, before a specific eight, uh, date to actually be able to create those allotments. Um, and that's a, a significant part of, of Alaska uh, land ownership, land use, and also self-determination for Native people. Um, part of that self-determination, which is um, often brokered sometimes well, sometimes not so well by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, is that um, you can't just, they, it's not super easy for them to sell that land. So it has to go through the federal process of land transfer. Um, which I guess is designed to protect people. Um, but sadly, on some level, sadly, many of those individual allotments have been moving towards uh, non-native landholders, um, in particular, hunting guides, fishing guides, vacation cabins. So, uh, yeah, just look up ANILCA, you'll see the legislation. I'm sorry, I don't remember what the acronym stands for. It's been a while. Thank you. Um, another question uh, is about LIDAR, uh, recognizing the cost involved. Is there a potential application of LIDAR to your study? Good question. So when I lived up there, we tried to do uh, and work for the Park Service. We tried to initiate a LIDAR survey in a settlement much further north of Brooks River, uh, which is also a very large settlement. Um, and um, in those days, it was much more costly because you had to have a fixed wing airplane to fly it. Now you don't. Um, so now you can do it with a drone, of course. And uh, a place like this at Wild Mount Lake, the application of contemporary lightweight uh, LIDAR where you, which, where you could charge the batteries with much, you know, much better uh, solar equipment would be spectacular. So in 2013, when we when we finished this survey, some of this was just coming together and we neither had the money nor the expertise to make it happen, but now that would be priceless. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, many questions have come in for you. So this is great. Uh, what is the current population in the area near the two volcanoes? Um, it's very low. Uh, <laughs> so Port Hyden, I think, probably has about 75 one season, maybe 150 in another. Chignik Lake, you know, has, um, I think there's like 15 families. Um, Chignik Bay is a little bit bigger, uh, but most of these communities are in the low hundreds. I mean, there's even some like a little bit further north in, my, in the study area that I showed you, going up to the King Salmon, Dog Salmon, Ugashik Rivers, communities like Ugashik, Pilot Point. I mean, there's only like 20 people in, in those settlements, at least permanent residents. They, they all, anything that's tied to a, a fishery will explode in the summer, um, both with uh, native uh, commercial fishermen, but also people from all over. So, I mean, I, the village I lived in had a population of 300 permanent residents. No road in, no road out. Wow. All right, we've got another question about, um, Oh, about sites there that you could see from the air but couldn't investigate or see from the ground? Were there any sites that you could see from the air that you couldn't investigate or see from the ground? So there were, there were, there were many that we could see from the air that we were able to map. 
Uh, and some of them, if we had a helicopter, we were able to land on them. Um, but we weren't, we didn't either have the time or the funds to investigate them properly. Um, you know, if we were doing a survey with a fixed wing airplane on wheels, there's no way to land anywhere near it. So there were some that we just mapped. We have photos, you know, we flew around it. Um, and those things uh, remain unexplored. In some cases, we went back a year later when we thought it was a particularly interesting location that would tell us something, for example, about the Meshik River, the one closest to the Antarctic volcano. And we thought, oh man, that's the largest settlement that anybody has seen anywhere close to this volcano. We'll find the money to get out there, get a helicopter to take us out, camp there for two weeks, walk to it and um, you know, do a couple of things within walking distance. And we were able to explore a few of those, but uh, there are literally dozens of unexplored um, settlements out there. And, you know, most likely most of them will remain unexplored, which is kind of unusual if you think about it. All right. Um, I don't see any, oh, oh, well, I don't see any other. Um, yeah, I have a question. Oh, there you yeah. go. Did you take an opportunity to interact with any of the kids or the mothers or education directors to sort of move them in the direction of becoming a scientist? That's a great question. Um, I mean, one of the things that uh, that was really, a, a, one of the things I really enjoyed most about going out to these communities, um, which you really had to do in the winter uh, because it's summertime, even though the, uh, you know, it seems like the best time to be out there, that's when people are busiest, you know, that's when, fishing season starts, that's when kids are brought out to work with their parents on boats. And um, so there's no chance to go down there for the, for the usual university researcher. But when you live out there, you could fly out. I mean, I could go down for a day uh, to one of these communities and, and go to the local school. Some of the local schools, you know, would have five to eight kids in the, you know, kindergarten through sixth grade, and then similar number of kids from seventh grade through high school and talk to them about the cultural heritage, often bring in, uh, get, get some of the, the elders to come in. And of course they love, they love that. Uh, and then talk about the way that their understanding of, of uh, their history and culture ties into the kinds of things that not only scientific archeological research is being done, but the way that some of these big land managers, meaning the federal land managers uh, think about both the resources that are inside those boundaries and the relationship between those resources and the local communities. Uh, and that was often a, a hard line to toe in part because it was not very popular with the park service, right? But the communities like to hear about it and they like to be involved in both the understanding of, the direction of, and the uh, interpretation of the cultural heritage of their ancestors inside what is a federally managed property. By the way, some of these are like Katmai is over twice the size of Yellowstone, uh, you know, so it's a big place. Um, one hopes that uh, folks were, would be interested in it, and of course some are, um, but, um, you know, pretty small communities. So the probability of any one kid uh, going and doing something like this when they could earn much better money in a shorter amount of time through commercial fishing is often pretty low. Any more questions? I don't see any in the chat. Last call, folks. <laughs> it's nice to see all the comments and, and questions on the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much for such an interesting talk. It was really great and we appreciate it. Um, this is the very last chance for questions, anybody? <laughs> okay. Oh, since there's none, I guess that's it for the night then. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it and I appreciate your questions. Thank you, Dr. Barton. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was very enjoyable. Enjoyed it. <clears throat>